I'm going to be talking about confidence in vaccines. I'm a research fellow at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and I've been researching confidence in vaccines since 2010 with um, Heidi Larson, and I co-lead the Vaccine Confidence Project with her there. So, um, why do we need to pay attention to vaccine confidence? Um, I'm sure this face is fairly familiar to most of you. This is Dr. Andrew Wakefield. He presented a, a paper in The Lancet um, in 1998 talking about the um, possible link between MMR and autism. Um, this caused a huge uh, plummet in public confidence. Coverage rates went below the, um, the herd immunity threshold, so from 91.5% to 79.9%. And also there's been outbreaks, so you were probably aware in Wales, and recently there's been an outbreak in Disney World in California because there's um, some people not vaccinating and um, Andrew Wakefield was struck off the medical register and the Lancet paper was retracted but he's still presenting in the US in um, Somali communities. Um, yeah, he sees himself as a bit of a victim and gets kind of support from that point of view. Um, this is another huge um, area where you can see that uh, lack of vaccine confidence has caused an impact in disease. So this is in Nigeria, this is a polio vaccination. Um, there was a boycott in 2003, and, and what happened here is there were concerns that the polio vaccine were, was causing infertility, and there were religious leaders um, spreading these concerns. So there was a boycott in the northern state of Nigeria, the Kano, and, and as a result, we're still trying to eliminate polio. There were importations into 10 countries. And um, another example of a vaccine that people were worried about it causing sterility. So this is a tetanus vaccine, and this was um, in, in the 1990s. So the concerns here were that there was a contraceptive vaccine that was developed that contained tetanus toxoid. So when the tetanus vaccine um, got introduced, there were worries that it caused infertility. And, and here, um, the concern spread through an organisation called Pro-Life, a Catholic church organisation, and, and it spread to 60 countries, including Mexico, Tanzania, Nicaragua, and the Philippines. And as a result, so in the Philippines, the mayor of Manila stopped vaccination programmes. So in 1993, the coverage was 70%, and it went down to 1990, in 1996, 47%. Um, what happened here is PAHO, uh, the WHO in, in the Americas, was very good at communicating with those concerned. And what they did, so there were a lot of um, different people testing the vaccine. Does it contain this hormone that could sterilise or not? And so PAHO went to these groups and said, listen, which laboratory would you trust? And they said, the, the Vatican. So they <laughs> tested in the Vatican and they said, There's not, this hormone is not in, in the vaccine. So they, they trusted that. But it's come up again. So there, there's issues in Kenya. So the Catholic Church have, have raised concerns about the tetanus vaccine causing sterility and they want further tests. And, um, and they found these concerns on the internet. So, so just because concerns go away doesn't mean they can't come back later in another country, uh, in different populations, different regions. Um, HPV vaccine. So in the UK, we've been very successful. You've been very successful. Um, there's been issues with the HPV vaccine in India. There's been some concerns. So here they did some demonstration projects in Andhra Pradesh and Gujarat. So initially there were groups that were concerned because it was why are you testing this vaccine out in these populations and not, not some, and the girls that were being tested were less educated than perhaps some others. So why, why is it being tested in these poorer communities? Why not in Delhi? Um, the, advocacy, the groups that were against the vaccine came from Delhi, um, and, then, and then the kind of, they weren't listened to, so they raised more and more concerns, and, and eventually they held a press release on World Health, um, uh, World Health Day, um, and, the gov and there'd been four deaths that weren't associated, but um, they raised more and more concerns, and so the Ministry of Health uh, stopped the demonstration project as a result of that. Um, yeah, so, so the, there can be a big impact um, of concerns. This, this is a cartoon. So Governor Rick Perry uh, was seen to be accepting money from the uh, pharmaceutical industry because 
in the US, he tried to, um, in Texas, he tried to mandate HPV vaccination in schools. And there were these concerns about the vaccine being a sex vaccine and that he was receiving money in order to mandate this vaccine. And um, in Japan, so more recently, there's been concerns because there's been some girls, unfortunately, that suffered from convulsions and seizures. And, and in this case, so the government, the Ministry of Health, um, didn't stop the vaccination, but they stopped recommending it. So, so we've got academics in, in Japan saying this is really difficult because if, if the only thing that the public hear are concerns from parents and the media and they're not hearing the doctor's point of view or the other side, then it, then it looks like that it's not sure what's happening and maybe this vaccine is unsafe. And also one family got compensation, so that gives the image that the vaccine might have caused it, this issue. So, um, yeah, so what we've seen in our research is that confidence issues vary considerably by country, by region, by population, by time, by vaccine. And we carried out a systematic review looking at vaccine hesitancy <coughs> to try and understand, um, I'll just show you in a minute. So the, the key determinants of trust and distrust and factors influencing vaccination decision-making. So one thing that we needed to start with is what does it mean to be vaccine hesitant? So, so it's a spectrum from definite vaccine refusal of all vaccines to potentially vaccinating against all, all vaccines, but maybe being a bit nervous or a bit worried or delaying vaccines. So we identified research on vaccine hesitancy and identified factors, so barriers or promoters of vaccination to, to further develop. So we worked with SAGE, the Strategic Advisory Group of Experts on Vaccine Hesitancy, to further develop their model. So this is their model. So it's already quite a complex model. Um, but so there's contextual influences. Um, so for example, leaders, uh, politics, religion, a pharmaceutical industry, geographical barriers, sorry. Um, vaccine vaccination specific issues, so the risk benefit of the vaccine, uh, role of healthcare professionals, and then this individual social group influences. So immunization as a social norm, uh, beliefs and attitudes, knowledge and awareness, and a few others, but those are the main, the main highlighted ones. So what we found is, um, so this we analysed over a thousand articles, so what we found is there's been more research um, more recently, but most of the research is happening in Americas and, and Europe, and also what we found is here, so um, the solid line is adults, so there's been more papers about vaccine hesitancy in adults and also adolescents, with the increase in vaccination for, for those groups. And um, the key points here are that it's fairly complex and that um, <laughs> socioeconomic groups can be barriers or promoters depending on how you're looking at them. And so this is all regions and then this is Europe. And uh, so the key influences as such, socioeconomic group as expected, religion, culture, gender, and risk benefits, and in Europe as well, so beliefs and attitudes. Um, yeah, so the main findings were there's more research, but uh, there's limited research where most of the children live, so, so there's a need for more research in low and middle income countries. And also, there's, uh, what's missing is broader contextual features, so it's, most of the studies are about social cognitive models and, and not about the more kind of multifactorial relationships at play. And also there's, there's lack of research on uh, clearly evaluated strategies, what works and what doesn't, but, but it's improving. And, and we've done some, some further, um, what I forgot to mention initially, so we're carrying out a further systematic review with SAGE, looking at strategies specifically to address vaccine hesitancy. Um, so this is, uh, we're publishing soon, a state of vaccine confidence report, and what we're showing here is no single metric tells the story. So. I discuss systematic reviews here, but you can also look at epi data, qualitative data. So I'm also part of a National Institute of Health Research, Health Protection Research Unit in Immunization. <laughs> Very catchy title. And in that, um, I'm doing some qualitative 
study on why um, some parents in the UK have decided not to vaccinate their child for the flu um, in, in the pilot study areas in Greater Manchester and West Yorkshire. And also we've done, and I'll just briefly talk to you about this, so media tracking, and we've done some survey data as well. Um, so for our media tracking, what we did is we were funded by the Gates Foundation, and um, we developed an information surveillance system. So what this means is uh, that we collected reports with HealthMap. They're um, an organisation in the States that collect data on disease, um, uh, and they specifically looked at vaccines for us. So these are reports, and we also did some kind of Google alerts as well. Uh, anything about vaccines, human vaccines, on the internet, and um, during this time period. So anything, so we, we collected positive and neutral and negative reports. We were initially gonna just collect the negative, so concerns, that side of it, um, vaccines have been withdrawn, but then we decided we needed a denominator, so, so we collected the positive neutral. So an example of a report would be, there's a new polio campaign in India, um, or there's a measles campaign, or come get vaccinated, that sort of side, side of it. Or there's new research about a vaccine. <coughs> Yeah, and um, so this was all manually coded, and um, it was quite a big work, but it really amazing, <laughs> really interesting results. So here, this is the positive neutral reports. So a lot of the reports were about vaccine development and introduction, and also the vaccine delivery program. And for the negative reports, so as expected, <coughs> adverse events, following immunisation. So these aren't necessarily, they don't need to be confirmed adverse events. It's just someone online, even in a blog saying, don't get this vaccine, it'll cause seizures, for example. Or don't get this vaccine, it'll cause narcolepsy. And then the one that's a really unique finding is this beliefs, awareness, perceptions. So that there's a lot of conspiracy theories, philosophical beliefs, religious beliefs, concerns about business motives and political motives. So, interesting reading and um and also this one so impact so there's an outbreak because there's no vaccination coverage or um the, the vaccine's being withdrawn or suspended and this is so this is looking globally um i thought i couldn't have a talk without mentioning risk perception drivers so so as a parent or someone that's about to be vaccinated you have these perceived risks so if something is natural, you, you perceive it to be less of a risk than if it's technological. If, if it's voluntary, so smallpox was um, compulsory and mandatory, so um, there, there were some kind of concerns about that back then. Uh, familiar versus non-familiar, so a new vaccine parents are more likely to be a bit more worried about. Control versus not in control, that's more as an example. If if you, um, for example, if my husband's driving the car, I feel less, like, a bit more nervous than if I'm driving. <laughs> Although he's a better driver. Um, high frequency, low consequence versus low frequency, high consequence. So, so if something's rare but really kind of dangerous, like uh, being struck by lightning, you might consider, or Ebola, people are more worried about it than something that's more likely to happen, but, but it's a bit less dangerous. Um, people are more likely to perceive risks for children rather than not children or reproduction and this might be one of the reasons why there's been concerns around the tetanus vaccine is because it's given to women at a reproductive age and also this idea of trust if you trust um, for example a vaccine so if you trust your provider you're more likely to want to be vaccinated um, controversy cells and um, stories uh, the risk perception of people relate to stories more than numbers. So I thought it was really good, Joe, that you gave an example that was a story and, and listening to stories rather than looking at probability, this is your risk factors. Um, some other findings. So this was uh, by LJ Tang. So I was at a um, conference in Lisbon with him recently. Um, so, so what's important is communication engagement. Vaccination is a social norm and it must be, you must remind that when you're talking to parents or, um, or adults, when you're vaccinating them. You need to understand the specific reasons for concern at a local level and address the concerns locally. Messaging and messages matter. So narratives are powerful tools. Um, communicating the risks of not vaccinating is important. And, and also this, so most parents do vaccinate. 
so they should be supported and can be powerful advocates. And um, methods to support providers to engage in conversations with parents. Um, I'll give a few examples. And best practices should be collected and shared. Um, this, this was from uh, Frederick Buda, who's done this um, study. So most people turn to and trust their GP or their pharmacy mm -hmm. local hospital. People are less trusting of media or the pharmaceutical companies. And um, this, I went to the website of NHS uh, Cervix Safety, and this is the doctor that everyone's trusting. <laughs> I'm not sure I trust those petri dishes, but... Uh, um, so don't think of it as getting a flu shot, think of it as installing virus protection software. So. <laughs> um, and this, so this was, uh, this is really important research by Daniel Opel in the University of Washington, which is, so the main, the main findings were, how does the provider initiate vaccine discussion? So if you say, it's time to start all those vaccines, we're going to do the MMR and chickenpox, then, so that's being presumptive, more people are likely to vaccinate, so 74% vaccinate. Whereas if the GP said, so how do you feel about vaccination? 4% uh, accept. 13% uh, come up with their own plan, so they kind of choose some vaccines, not others, and de delay, and 83% resist. So, and um, at this other conference, I can't remember the exact details, but I think it was in the States, they say, okay, so your teenager's here, we're going to do the booster and the, um, is it tetanus? I'm not sure. But, and how do you feel about HPV vaccine? Oh, no, it's meningococcal. And how do you feel about HPV vaccine? So people were not accepting HPV vaccine. And, and so their advice was to healthcare providers say, OK, we're going to do the, the booster, HPV, and meningococcal. So if you put it in the middle, people are more likely to, to accept it. Um, and this, so this is a, cam a brilliant campaign from the NHS. So it's, it's giving... So the teenage girl is in control and, and it's kind of being kind of relating and, and there's been testing to see what, what, what is acceptable. And, and in, in the US, after their, their concerns about the sex vaccine, so they rebranded it as a closing the door to cancer. It's a cancer vaccine. And also they created some great um, <coughs> questions and answers to help um, with GPs. So for example, if, if the parent's concerned, then you try saying HPV vaccine is very important because it prevents cancer. I want your child to be protected from cancer. That's why I'm recommending it. And also that research has shown that getting the HPV vaccine does not make kids more likely to be sexually active at a younger age. And um, I quite like this image of the side effects, the so benefits and side effects of vaccination. This is the NHS webpage as well. And, and it's great that, that um, there's a team in Oxford collecting questions to try and help healthcare providers as well. Uh, that's it for my presentation. We, we've got a webpage if you're interested, come have a look. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you.